Welcome to Island Crimes and Mysteries. And now, it's time to join your host, Newells, for another episode. Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of Ireland Crimes and Mysteries. I want to thank you for joining me today. And if you're a returning listener, I want to say a big thank you for your continued support. If this is your first time listening to my podcast, welcome. It's great to have you on board. Right, guys, quick pause before we start, because there's another podcast that I have to tell you about. It's absolutely fantastic, especially if your curiosity knows no bounds. Give a warm round of ear time to the Rainy Day Rabbit Hole podcast hosted by Shay and Jody from the Pacific Northwest, just over the big pond to the west of us. It's the perfect companion for those days you're craving deep dives into fascinating tales, obscure facts and those thought provoking stories that stick with you long after the episode has ended. Actually, you know what? I'll let the girls tell you all about it themselves. Have you ever wondered what lurks in the dark and misty woods of the Pacific Northwest? Or how Starbucks became the coffee giant we know today? Why Oregon has so many serial killers? Or if Bigfoot really poops in the woods? Then you need to listen to the Rainy Day Rabbit Holes podcast. I'm Shay. And I'm Jody. Join us each week as we bring you the not-so-serious side of Pacific Northwest history. On our show, you can hear great content like... This wine smelled, to me, reminiscent of urinal cake. Ooh, gosh. And thoughtful insights like... Next time, next time I accidentally show up to one of these, I'm just going to whip my ass out. There's your tip. And then I'm going to say, no tip, we're even. Discover the charm and intrigue of this region like never before, where every raindrop leads to a new adventure. If you like your history hysterical, then join us every week. Whether you're a Pacific Northwest native, a transplant, or just curious about the upper left corner of North America, this podcast is for you. Subscribe to Rainy Day Rabbit Holes on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. And let the rain take you on a wild ride. See you down the rabbit hole. So another great find there, I have to say. So give the girls a follow over on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get your podcast from. And as I said before, you won't be disappointed. Now, back to our story today. Today we travel to the affluent suburb of Castle Knock. With a population of over 8,000 people, it lies approximately 8 kilometres west of Dublin city centre. It is a busy commercial and residential hub just off the M50 and as its official website describes it, beautifully blends the old with the new, the urban with the rural. Castle Knock borders the Phoenix Park, which is the largest enclosed public park in a European capital city. It is here you will find Oris on Uchtron, the home of our sitting president, as well as other attractions like Dublin Zoo. The Phoenix Park is always a hive of activity with events taking place or just people out walking, cycling or having a puck around with their hurley and slitter. Farmley House is also located in Castle Knock. This was one of the former homes of the famous Guinness family. It is now the official state guest house for visiting dignitaries to the country. It is here in Castle Knock that Jean Gilbert lived with her husband David Burke and their three children aged 12, 9 and 5 in 2007. But all was not as it seemed in the Gilbert Burke household. Jean lived within the confines of a marriage that was characterised by control and jealousy and she desperately wanted to escape and start a new life free from David's clutches. But David had other ideas and what transpired on the 28th of August 2007 would shatter any dreams of a happy future for Jean. Let's look at Jean's story. Having grown up in Terra Noor in South Dublin, Jean had one brother and one sister. She was described by those who knew her as kind and driven. Passionate about whatever project she was pursuing. Dedicated to her family and her career. At 17, Jean had started working life as a lab technician before going to college and gaining her third level qualification in food science. Securing a well-paying job, she bought her first house in Castle Knock and as her career progressed, 
gained, to her credit, the development of the first gummy bear that was free from artificial colours and flavourings. Despite having such a high profile job, Jean was a private person who loved spending time with her three children. Her friends describing her as loving with a sense of humour. In 1986, Jean went on a Buddhist trip to Tokyo, where she met a fellow Buddhist named Bob. He was an English musician. They struck up a relationship which continued for the next year and a half. Bob travelling to Ireland to spend time with Jean and she travelling to England to spend time with him. Then for some unknown reason they lost contact before re-establishing contact in 1988. Bob had been the love of Jean's life and when contact was re-established she wrote a letter to him asking him to marry her. But Bob would decline her offer later saying it was one of the biggest regrets of his life. It just seemed like bad timing as Bob was trying to build his career at the time and felt it just wasn't the right time for marriage. Jean remained single for the next couple of years after Bob before meeting David Burke in the early 90s. He was from Mullingar in County Westmead. Described as well-educated, David gave off the impression to anyone that knew him that he was a lovely guy. Having moved to Dublin in 1993, he started working with Hibernian Insurance as an insurance administrator earning a moderate wage, and began seeing Jean. After dating for a while, David moved into Jean's house in Castleknock and they set up home together. They would get married in Kalini, South Dublin, in 1995. After their first child was born, Jean was finding it difficult being a new mother, holding down a high-pressure job and being a dedicated wife to David. Then she was made redundant, which to Jean was actually a blessing, as the pressure was beginning to tell on her. But it did have its downsides, in that now they only had David's moderate wage to live off of. So there was an obvious shift in not only the dynamics of the relationship, but it also had a financial shift for them. They no longer had Jean's good wages coming in, and David had always been controlling when it came to money. So now that Jean was a stay-at-home mother and David was bringing in the wage, Jean was at his mercy and he became even more controlling. To the outside world, everything seemed fine. They came across as a happily married couple. But over time, David's control continued to grow behind the walls of their home in Castle Knock. David would later describe the marriage as a normal marriage, saying they did things as any family would do, even going on holidays every year to France. But Jean's friends were beginning to have their doubts and began to grow concerned for her. They had noticed by the autumn of 2006 that Jean was not herself. She was losing weight to the point she was fitting into children's clothes. A few friends had asked her directly what was going on, but she would always say all was well. But one friend, while on the phone to Jean, insisted on her telling her what was wrong. After a lot of persuasion, Jean eventually gave in and told her friend everything. She said the marriage was in a bad way. David was controlling every aspect of her life. She said he never went out, was home all the time, so she never had a break from the toxic atmosphere he created within the home. She also found him to be overcritical of the children, a fact that really upset Jean, and she was really concerned about it. She described their intimate relationship as unspeakable, going on to say that she had gone through 10 years of hell with him. The friend, despite having their suspicion something was wrong, was shocked by all the admissions made by Jean, who went on to say to them that she was not in love with David and felt under immense pressure. Despite having an inkling things were bad, her friend did not realise it was this bad. Jean had been carrying all this for years and never opened up to anyone about what was going on or how she was feeling. David controlled her, their children, the finances. Jean had no independence of her own. He had all the power, but Jean would never confront David. She lived with it all for those 10 years. That was until 2007. Jean was at her wit's end and started to stick up for herself. David didn't like this newfound assertiveness Jean had suddenly acquired. And also at this time, by sheer coincidence, Bob got back in touch with Jean. 
Despite having rejected her marriage proposal, Jean had never been too far from Bob's thoughts. He had heard she was married and had children and wanted to reconnect. So he wrote her a letter and from there the correspondence picked up pace by email and text. It was just coincidental that Bob had got back in touch around the same time as Jean had started telling people about her home life and the state of her marriage. Bob getting back in touch brought Jean back to a simpler, happier time in her life, where she felt loved and appreciated, and she was anxious to grasp onto this feeling, and so the correspondence continued. With each letter that was sent, they became more romantic and intimate. She even suggested in one letter that she would sell her engagement ring and wedding ring to fund a trip to Japan, to the place where they'd first met. She told Bob she wanted them to be together for as long as they could in this lifetime. Bob, despite concurring with Jean, said that the matter would have to be dealt with in a delicate fashion, as there was children involved. This new rekindled relationship with Bob gave Jean strength. And she knew her next step would have to be to end her marriage to David. This was not going to be easy. She had not, at this point, started a physical relationship with Bob and wanted to have David told before it went that far. She wanted a clean slate and to start afresh. She didn't want to be sneaking around behind anyone's back. One friend stating that Jean was straight as a die. She wanted to do everything cleanly. So, on Friday, June the 15th, Jean brought David out to the local pub. While there, Jean told him she didn't love him. With David later saying that Jean had allegedly told him that she had never really loved him. She went on to tell him that she had met and was in love with another person and that their marriage was over. David said he was destroyed by this revelation. He never saw it coming. Jean would later tell a friend she deliberately went to a public place to tell David to be away from any knives, which shocked her friend. Jean was very afraid of how David would react. She gave David a month to be out of the house and she moved into another bedroom in the house. From the moment she told him she didn't love him, they began to live their lives separately. Four days after Jean's revelation to David, he went to visit her parents and her brother. He told them that he was devastated by what had transpired. The following day they met with Jean, who for the first time was brutally honest with her family. She also admitted to having rekindled relations with Bob, but was at pains to say that nothing physical had happened. And if David had been a better husband, she would have never even considered looking elsewhere. When they heard the full story of what her life had really been like, Her family were very supportive of her decision. As the days went on, David became more frustrated by this turn of events and was not happy with the explanation Jean had given him, believing there was more to the story. He started going through her stuff and there, amongst all her belongings, he found the letters from Bob. He began to read them and as he turned each page, his anger built. Here, in black and white, was Jean planning out a new life with Bob. As he read on, he got the impression that Bob was offering to be father to his children. This enraged David. He made copies of the letters and emails and hid them at his sister's shop. He said after finding these letters, he became very depressed and had to take time off work. He would often be seen just wandering around the local park by neighbours, lost in his thoughts. His appearance began to become dishevelled and he always looked like he had been crying, according to some of his work colleagues. They said he had changed. In reality, David was losing control over Jean for the first time and he did not like it. He wasn't able to dictate her every move, what she did and when she did it. He felt his world was collapsing. If he didn't have this power and control, he had nothing. He was beginning to spiral out of control. Jean, on the other hand, felt relief that it was all out in the open and she felt she was starting to take control back of her life. David blamed Jean and Jean alone for everything that was now happening in his own life. He was blind to the fact that it was his actions that had brought them to this juncture in their marriage. 
He was the controller, but he couldn't see that. He was the one who had made Jean's life miserable. He was the one who she feared. And he was the one she saw as the corrosive to the well-being of her children, with his constant browbeating of them. Then in July 2007, Jean went to a Buddhist retreat in France. She wanted a bit of time to relax after all the turmoil of the last few weeks. On her return, she flew into Dublin, but decided to get an onward flight to Southampton to see Bob rather than head straight home. She stayed with Bob for four or five nights. Meanwhile, David was still in the family home and was showing no signs of finding somewhere new within the month as Jean had requested. He was not going to make this separation easy for Jean, that was for sure. On her return, she found life once again within the walls of her Castleknock home stifling. David was making the day-to-day very difficult. So about a month after her initial visit to Bob, she returned, and this time she stayed for 10 days. Bob had by now handed in his notice at his work, as well as on his flat. Jean bought him a car and they both started to pack up his belongings, as the plan was he was moving back to Dublin with Jean. They headed back to Dublin on the 26th of August 2007 via Hollyhead. Meanwhile, David was spiralling even more. He had gone to see a psychotherapist who, after talking to David, became concerned for his welfare and gave him the number of the Samaritans and prescribed him sleeping tablets and antidepressants. He took more time off work. David was not handling this breakup at all well. Ireland, crimes and mysteries. Late on that August evening, after arriving back in Dublin, Jean and Bob checked into a hotel near her home in Castleknock, full of excitement for their future as a couple. They went over to her house in Castleknock and had something to eat. At this point, David was not there. He had drove to Mullingar to collect their children who had been staying with his parents. Jean had texted him to say not to rush back, as she had made plans to stay with a friend for the night. When they finished the food, they headed back to the hotel. David later returned to the house and saw the two unwashed dinner plates and wine glasses. He could also get the smell of cigarettes in the air. He knew Jean had Bob over. He just had that gut feeling. This enraged David. He felt this was the final straw. She had brought this strange man into the family home. In David's mind, Jean had crossed a line. That night, the 26th of August, Jean spent in the hotel with Bob. The following morning, she headed home. David had spent the night getting angrier and angrier since he discovered she had brought Bob back into the house. When she walked in the door, she was met with a seething David and a very intense argument ensued. Both calling each other awful names, the argument ended with David storming out of the house. He would later say that he left the house to clear his head, telling his work colleague in a text he had to go at that point or he would have actually killed her, saying he hated her. Bob was back at the hotel looking for a job and searching for a place to live. Jean was still in the house when David returned, but left after telling him she was going to see her mother. She met up with Bob later that evening and went for a drink before heading back to the hotel. While with Bob, she got a text from David. He called her a liar, saying he knew she hadn't gone to see her mother. She left the hotel around 11pm and headed home. David was there and his anger and resentment had been building throughout the day. Another row ensued. This one even more intense than the last. David threatened her that if she brought a man back to the house again, there would be serious consequences. They then went to their respective rooms without having come to any resolution. Jean upset and angry and David about to explode. Jean had no idea that David's anger was getting to the point where she was actually in danger, as he was about to completely flip at any moment. Normal reasoning for David was gone out the window. At around 5.30 that morning, Tuesday the 28th of August, David heard movement from the room Jean was in and heard her going down the stairs and out the door. He ran over to his bedroom window and saw her getting into her car. Their eyes met briefly as she left the driveway. He knew where she was going and the red mist descended. 
He spent the morning working himself up more and more about Jean's early morning visit to Bob. Jean had texted David after she left to say she had gone out to get a message, to which he replied, What message can you get at this hour? His jealousy was taking over at this point and he was not able to think rationally. He had the children with him in the house that morning and waited for Jean to return. All reasoning for David was gone. His rage was so intense it had reached the point of no return. Then at around 10am Jean arrived home to David, who had been upstairs playing with the three children, before they headed downstairs to watch TV, which is where they were when Jean walked through the door. David would later say that while in the shower that morning, his mind was racing, and this was the first time it had crossed his mind to get a knife. He said that when she arrived home, she had a smug look on her face, which enraged him even more. Jean went into the sitting room and sat down watching TV with her children. David made some breakfast for his daughter. It was while he was making his daughter's breakfast that he saw the kitchen knife. He picked it up and hid it behind his back in his jeans pocket. He walked into the sitting room where Jean sat with the children. He started to provoke her yet again into starting an argument, calling her a tramp and accusing her of taking their son's mobile phone and giving it to Bob. There was a heated back and forth after this before David, in a seething rage, lunged at Jean with the knife from his back pocket, pushing her over the back of the sofa and as she landed on the ground, he continued to stab her. Jean all the while fighting back and sustaining several defensive wounds in the process as she shouted at him to stop, that she hadn't taken their son's mobile phone and given it to Bob. This attack took place in front of their three children. Their daughter would later say that she saw her dad stab her mother and he was very angry. She said she saw her mother start to go pale on the sitting room floor and shouted at her dad to stop before asking him why he had killed her mother. Their youngest son was also shouting at his father to stop, traumatised by what he was witnessing. The children had witnessed the most heinous act perpetrated on their mother by their father and David didn't seem to care. Then like a bolt from the blue he appeared to snap out of the rage he was in. He suddenly stopped attacking Jean, stood up and placed the knife on the mantelpiece over the fireplace. Then her distraught nine-year-old daughter ran to her mother and tried to start resuscitating her. David calmly walked into the kitchen and got some tissues and then returned to the sitting room and put a pillow under Jean's head. He then went out to the phone and at 10.30am called the emergency services. He told them he had stabbed her a couple of times and she was unconscious, but he thought she was still alive. The operator on the other end of the phone, worried for the safety of the children, asked him to take them to the neighbours until help arrived, but he refused, saying he loved his children and would not hurt them. He also said he would not harm Jean any further and asked them to get there as soon as they could. He then hung up on the operator, saying he was too emotional to talk any further. When the emergency services did arrive, they were greeted by Jean unconscious on the floor and her three traumatised children still in the room. They sprang into action trying to stabilise the bleeding before rushing Jean to Connolly Hospital in Blanchardstown, where doctors spent the next few hours trying to stabilise her. The Gardaí arrived at the home around 11am and David was arrested there and then for assault initially. They said he was very calm and emotionless. He pointed to the knife on the mantelpiece and told the guardie that was the weapon he had used in the attack. He was then taken to Blanchettstown Garda Station for questioning and the scene was preserved. On arrival at the station, David became very emotional, saying he never meant to kill Jean. He just wanted her to experience the same pain he was experiencing since she ended the marriage. He also said he hated her, but went on to say that hate was a funny concept because he also still loved her. He told them he only first had the idea in the shower that morning, but kept reiterating he never wanted to kill her. He only wanted to cause her the same hurt and pain he was feeling. He told the guardie about the letters, stating, I read her letters. She was going to leave me. That's why I killed her. 
Meanwhile, Jean was undergoing emergency surgery at Connolly Hospital, but her condition began to deteriorate. And despite Trojan efforts by the medical staff, at 3.29pm, Jean was pronounced dead. She had sustained four stab wounds to her back, which were 14 centimetres deep and injured vital organs, including her aorta, her kidney, her spleen and both her lungs, causing massive blood loss, which led to her death. All the while, Bob was trying to contact Jean to no avail. He was beginning to get worried and concerned and after receiving no reply all day, made the decision to go to the house. When he arrived there, he was greeted by the crime scene tape and knew then that his worst fear was actually a reality. David was re-arrested on suspicion of the murder of Jean at 4.55pm when Gardy became aware of Jean's fate. David made no comment to this charge. At his trial, which started in the Central Criminal Court in Dublin on the 23rd of March 2009, David pleaded not guilty. David's defence tried to use the argument that Jean's actions prior to her murder had driven David to despair, causing him to act out and end her life. They said the family was a normal, happy unit until Bob reappeared in Jean's life. While giving his testimony, David cried continuously. He said he was emotionally destroyed when he found out his marriage was over and that Jean was seeing someone else. He said he had not been at all expecting it. It was a bolt from the blue. He portrayed himself as caring and decent, which confused people. They were looking at a man in the stand sobbing uncontrollably, saying how much he loved his wife. But on the other hand, this was a man who had attacked and killed his wife in front of their own children. The David in front of them and the David who committed the act appeared poles apart. This line of defence upset her family and friends immeasurably, as it sought to pull apart Jean's reputation. David was making himself out to be the victim, making out that Jean's infidelity was the cause of everything, and she had provoked him into attacking her by her actions. He made out he was not guilty of murder. He was the wronged party. Jean was the cause of it all, having an affair and flaunting it in front of him. The defence described Bob as a predator and as a classless, ageing gigolo who was only after Jean for her money. He had been left traumatised by Jean's murder. He had went back to the UK prior to the trial and was too upset to return and give evidence. The defence never mentioned how unhappy Jean was within the marriage or the level of control David had over her. One friend commented after the trial that Jean's reputation had been savaged. The jury never heard about how much despair Jean had been in for the previous 10 years. This had been the case since 1997 and she only expressed it to her family in June 2007. The defence just attacked Jean's character in their attempt to get the murder charge reduced to manslaughter, which obviously would upset her grieving family. Bob was left a changed man after Jean's murder. His friends said he was a shadow of his former self. He was very upset about how he had been portrayed by the defence. He called it a cheap shot and expressed his love and devotion to Jean. He completely rejected the claims that he was only after Jean for her money. He, after all, had given up his career and his home in the UK to be with Jean. On the 30th of March 2009, the jury retired to consider their verdict. Was it murder or manslaughter? He had, after all, admitted to stabbing her, this act resulting in her death. Would his argument that he had been provoked by her affair with a man she had brought to the family home be enough to get him manslaughter? We know he had spoken about killing her prior to the attack in a text to his friend. Was this enough to say it was premeditated? The judge, in summing up, had instructed the jury to decide if David's defence of a provocation was true or was David just a really good actor. The jury were out for over eight hours. When they returned, they found David guilty by a majority verdict of 11 to 1 of Jean's murder. When he heard the verdict, David went into visible shock. He was heard muttering, I can't believe it. But this time there were no tears, like there had been when he was giving his evidence. 
He obviously thought he had put up a strong defence and would get manslaughter, but the jury did not buy it. They saw through his defence that Jean was to blame. His victim blaming had not worked. They saw him for the manipulative person he was. The families on both sides were upset. There were no winners here. Jean's family in particular by how she had been portrayed throughout the trial. They would later say that Jean had tried for years to make the marriage work but had failed. They said David was not the man he made himself out to be in public. David appealed his conviction in December 2012. The court heard that he had gone through what he described as hate, love and flipping out after Jean told him the marriage was over. It was said that the judge at the original trial had tried to rewrite the law on provocation in relation to his intention to kill her at the time, stating that he could have had the intention to kill her, but that provocation would have reduced the verdict to manslaughter. Again making out that Jean was responsible for his actions that day and it was ultimately her fault what had happened to her. The three judges at the appeal dismissed his claim, stating that the trial judge had charged the jury fairly in relation to the law and provocation and rejected his appeal in January 2013. David Burke's controlling and manipulative nature behind closed doors was juxtapositioned to his mild and meek manner in public. Jean was the one in the marriage who was of an outgoing nature, who had many friends and was loved by all who knew her. David, on the other hand, had few friends, came across as a bit of a loner, probably felt inferior to his wife in some way. She was the one who had had the successful career and had bought the house they lived in, which probably made him feel emasculated in some way. So the only way he could feel in control was to control Jean's life in every way. And when he was losing this dominance, he flipped with no thought for his children who witnessed everything. David now languishes in Wheatfield Prison serving a life sentence for Jean's murder. Another very sad case with no winners, as I said. The children left with no parents and the horrific memories of seeing their father murder their mother and the subsequent bashing of their mother's reputation in court. There are no words, really. I will just leave you with a description of Jean by one of her friends. Jean was an honourable woman who put all her energy into her children. She was neat and low-key and somewhat shy and had difficulty expressing her feelings. She didn't give much away. She was a trooper. She'd keep going even when things were tough. She didn't moan. She didn't complain. She didn't gossip. So guys, that's it for today's episode of the Arling Crimes and Mysteries podcast. Again, thanks for your listenership and don't forget to subscribe to the show and hit that auto download so you never miss an episode. Until the next time, keep your eyes open and your mind curious. This podcast has been compiled from information gathered in the public sphere, like news articles, documentaries and open source material that can be found on the web. Everything in this podcast is alleged unless a conviction has taken place. You've been listening to Island Crimes and Mysteries. Join Newell's for another episode coming real soon. And keep up to date by following our social media sites, our YouTube channel, and our website, islandcrimesandmysteries.ie.